Have you seen this picture? What is it a picture of? Mustard seed and two fingers. <laughs> a thumb and a finger actually, right? Holding a mustard seed, showing you how tiny the mustard seed is. And with the, the, that mustard seed, Jesus said that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. You can do incredible, impossible things. And that's what we've been believing. And we've been looking at now seven realities of experiencing the presence of God. Today, we're at the seventh reality, the final one. And it's the one that um, may be as challenging as any of the others. But let me kind of just review for you. First off, we believe that God's at work. And if you can put the, the picture up there, that'll help. God's at work. He's working around us. He's working through us. He's accomplishing his purposes. Whether we see it or not, whether we know everything that God's doing, God's at work. God also loves us unconditionally. And it's that God wants to have a relationship with us, a love relationship with us. With that relationship, he invites us. Because he loves us and we then start to respond to his love, he invites us to become part of his work. The, the people that will be volunteering with Vacation Bible School are becoming a part of his work this week. Uh, by the way, Maxine's up front here, and, and her Scarlet, right? With her, with her little baby Scarlet, four months old. Maxine is fruit of the ministry of this church from several years back now, and she used to come to Kids Connection. Um, she's now 22. <laughs> And yet she, she, she was blessed, and she's here this morning with her little baby Scarlet, uh, and, and uh, staying with Roxanna too, by the way. So we just celebrate that an example of God working in somebody's life. God loves us. God invites us to start then serving him and to do ministry with him. When he does that, he usually speaks to us in specific ways. I still remember that, that Sunday I was standing there and I felt God calling me into the ministry, 16 years old. And I could hear God literally say, Bill, I want you to become a pastor. I want you to go into ministry for me. I remember, I remember struggling for, with it for a while, thinking, you know, okay, I was supposed to accept Christ. I'm like, I accepted Christ. I don't need to accept Christ again. No, no, no. God said, I, I want you to go into the ministry. Now, I think he wants all of us, by the way, to go into the ministry. And I think there's a calling like that. And I think God speaks to us, every single one of us, if we will listen. And that moves us not only from God speaking to the crisis of belief. God challenges us to do something. He may literally have said, be at worship this morning. And you said, well, I don't know if I want to go. It's, you know, the bed feels nice. It's cool outside. Uh, maybe I'll just go down and sit by the lake. I can worship better there than, than at First Baptist. I mean, are any of you tempted? No, you don't have to admit that. There's a crisis of belief. Am I going to do what God says? There's the crisis. Am I going to follow through with action after he's invited me, after he's spoken to me? That's what happened to Moses. He meets God at the burning bush, and God says, okay, I want you to set the, my people free. And Moses says, not me. You got the wrong person. Get somebody else, God. And God says, no, I've chosen you. No, come on. And there's that crisis. I, are we going to believe? Are we going to act upon what God says we're supposed to do? And if we do, then we've got to make adjustments. And that's some of what probably Moses was uncomfortable with. He didn't want to have to make the adjustments. Why? Because he murdered a guy back in Egypt, and he was going to have to go back where they had been out to try to kill him because he had murdered an Egyptian. And he didn't think that the Israelites would follow him anyways. So he's like, why would I want to leave the sheep and my wife and the kids and all that and go into Egypt where the Israelites are in slavery? And he's going to have to adjust his life in order to experience God's power working through him. He's going to have to make that adjustment so that he can experience God. And with that, that will bring him finally and ultimately then to the step that we're looking at this morning. When you obey, not before, after you obey, and as you are obeying, that's when you experience the presence and the power of God. So this morning, we're going to look at a guy that you've all uh, heard about, a guy who um, had dinner with a fish, big fish, okay? We have to say it was a fish because, some, you know, all the scientific stuff, you know, well, if it was a whale, he would have eaten up with acid, you know, it had to be a fish, you know, who knows all that? Oh, you know, that, the Bible says that a big fish came along and took, took Jonah for a swim and housed him for three days, <laughs> 
Well, we're going we're gonna to look at the story of Jonah. And the, the, the title for this morning's message is Joining God Requires Obedience. Joining God Requires Obedience. You see, obedience really is your moment of truth. What you do, what you do will determine, will reveal what you believe about God. Your obedience shows what you believe about God. Secondly, it will determine whether you will experience his mighty work in and through you. If you want to experience God working through your life, you've got to obey. And thirdly, it will determine whether you come to know him more intimately, and that's ultimately the goal is to get to know God more intimately. Henry Blackaby said, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. When God starts working through you, you get to know God better. And as you allow God to work through you, you experience the power of God more in your life. Well, what did God tell, tell Jonah to do? <laughs> Jonah, verse 1, chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Pretty easy task, right? Just go tell the people in Nineveh, it's a really bad city, they don't believe in God. Go tell them that God doesn't like them and they are wicked. Now, some people might like going and saying that. Nineveh, you're wicked, except that well, we'll hear later why Jonah didn't like that. Verse 3 says, he went down, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Have you ever fled when God asks you to do something? Go talk to your neighbor. Uh, I think I got to go to work now, don't I? <laughs> You know, that, that person over there needs you to go pray for them. Um, uh, can I pray from here, God? <laughs> um, go, go, go talk to the person there in the post office, you know, and stop and, and visit with them. And uh, uh, Lord, um, they look really weird. I, I think uh, maybe somebody else should do that. I must have a stomach ache. That's why I'm very thinking these things today, Lord. Have you ever fled from what God asked you to do? Have you ever not obeyed when God asked you to do something? The sad thing is probably all of us. <clears throat> so God's not one to give up on us. Have you noticed it? And God decides he's going to try to redirect Jonah. And how does he do that? Well, Jonah 1.6, a big storm starts to come up. And, the, and the, the men on board start realizing this is getting really bad. They start throwing things overboard off the ship and cargo and everything. And then finally they say, this is, it's not helping, something's wrong. They've all been praying to their gods. And then in verse six it says, the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Jonah's down hiding in the bottom of the boat and, and sleeping. And the captain comes to him, what in the world are you doing, man? We're all about to die and you're sleeping down here? Get up and call on your God. See, it's a day when they had lots of gods. Everyone had multiple gods. So you call on your God. Maybe one of them will listen. Maybe your God. And so maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And Jonah kind of says, you know, guys, I'm afraid um, I know what's wrong. Really? What is it? I'm the problem. In verse 8, so they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Because, see, they cast lots. And the lot came up, oh, Jonah, you're the guy. Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Now listen to Jonah's answer. I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. <laughs> and what do the guys do? They get upset. Why would these guys who worship all kinds of gods get upset when Jonah says that? Because he's just told them, you know the God who made the sea that's all right now in you know, big uproar and trying to t destroy our boat and is about to kill us? You know, that I know the God who, who does that. <laughs> he's my God. <laughs> he's the Lord of the sea and everything and the land. And oh, wow. 
Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. This is amazing. These these God worshipers of multiple gods have decided Jonah's the problem. And Jonah has said, you got to throw me overboard. And they're like, we can't do that. In fact, they started working harder to try to get to land, and that didn't help. So then they said, okay, we've just, I guess there's nothing else we can do. We're going to have to throw him overboard. But okay, now they pray to Jonah's God. God, Lord, please don't hold his life against us. Please, if we're throwing an innocent man overboard, we're sorry. But it seems like that's what we're supposed to do. So here we go. Forgive us. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly belly of the fish three days and three nights. Do you think he's gotten Jonah's attention? (laughs) God is working to redirect Jonah, and sometimes God has to take extravagant means to even redirect us, doesn't he? I've got to get your attention. Okay, so you you didn't want to stop. Well, then maybe I'll make the car stop for you. I'll force you into this. I'm somehow going to make you recognize that this is an opportunity. So Jonah in the belly of the whale. What would you do in the belly of a fish? <laughs> because, because here's Jonah down there, and it says he's got, as he describes this situation, he's got seaweed wrapped around him. He's, he's, he's in the dark. Fortunately, the pressure tank, I guess, of the fish is protecting him as he's going underwater and up and down. Who knows what's happening? I mean, just imagine this, all this water and other stuff that's inside there. He can't see a thing, and, and it's got to be cold or something like that in there, right? But I guess the fish is keeping him somewhat warm and all. But you're inside of a fish. Have you ever been here before? Any of you, any of you old enough to remember Jaws? Da-dum, 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 da-dum. Da, 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 da. And, then, and then there, there comes Jaws, you know. And now when we go to Universal Studios and we see Jaws, it's like, you know, that was scary. <laughs> but if you're inside of a fish, you've never been here before and you don't know what's going to happen. And yes, what do you do when you're inside of the belly of a fish and you've been running from God? You have a prayer meeting. <laughs> and it gets very serious. God? <laughs> And listen to this. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. I wonder if God can hear through through, through a fish. Obviously, he must be able to, huh? (laughs) Even underwater. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Jonah says, I'm dead. I mean, it's over. I'm in a fish. We're going down. I'm dying. Those who cling to to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. What's, What's Jonah doing? Okay, God, take me out of here, and I'll go preach salvation. None of you have ever done anything like that, right? God, if you get me out of this then I'll be an evangelist for you, okay? God, if you take care of me in this situation, I'll do anything you want. I'll even go and talk to that neighbor I don't like. I mean, I'll do anything for you, God. I'll go to Africa. Well, maybe not Africa. I'll go to China. Not really China either. Where do they have food I like? Anyways, God, I'll go somewhere and I'll preach salvation for you if, if that's what you want. If you just get me out of this fish, Now, the sad thing is, and if you were to look closely at this book, you would find that there's not any real sense of repentance on Jonah's part. You notice it? It's just, I'm about to die. God, get me out of here, and I'll preach salvation. None of, oh, God, I know you asked me to go, and I disobeyed you. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, God, forgive me. But it's, oh, God, (laughs) get me out of here. And I'll preach salvation. And what does God do for Jonah? (laughs) Folks, 
Of course he's in the belly of a fish and he prays. Isn't that what everyone would do? And what does God do? He makes the fish sick. And he barfs him up onto the beach. Now, you've got to get a picture of this. He's been in a fish for three days. What do you think you would look like after you'd been in a fish for three days? What do you think you'd smell like after you'd been in a fish for three days? So you got all, I mean, you're, you're somewhat bleached from being in that fish and in that water, wrinkly skin and the whole bit. You're smelling like stinky fish. And now, and now you smell like fish barf. I don't know what fish barf smells like, but it had to be pretty nasty because it got Jonah out of that fish. Now, up on the shore. Now, and some wonder. Now, now, why didn't the fish just dump him out on the water and make him swim to shore? He would have been a lot cleaner that way, right? But, but he takes him up, he, nice fish, takes him up to the shore, barfs him out onto the... And then you say, quit saying barf. Well, that's exactly what happened, okay? And now what's, what's Jonah going to do? Well, with all this fish barf and everything else all over him and seaweed and everything else, he's okay, I'm going to Nineveh. And he goes into Nineveh and he starts preaching. Nineveh is a big city. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I'm in chapter 3, verse 1. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. In verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. And here's, here's what he preached. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he preached. He didn't come and say, oh, you people. Life must be difficult for you here in Nineveh. And let me talk to you about a God who really cares about you. God understands your needs. A God who hurts alongside of you. No, no, what does he say? He's just walking around. He walks into the city. It takes him a while to get a whole day to get inside the city. And he says, hey, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Yes. I mean, literally, he probably did the yes, by the way. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Yes. Because he does not like Nineveh. He doesn't care for them at all. He's only doing this because God told him to and he had got barfed out of that fish. And so he said, okay, God, I'll do it. I told you I'd preach salvation and I'll preach it. Forty more days and Nineveh is destroyed. Yes, I can't wait for it. Oh, oh but God has a different thought. Verse 9. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that, he, so that we will not perish. Who's that? It's the king of Nineveh. Word has gone throughout the city. People are starting to fast and pray. I don't know. Do you think that would work in Crestline? 40 more days, Crestline, and God's going to destroy you. Is that what it would take for, us, for, for this city to change? It's not really very um, user-friendly, is it? <laughs> it's, it's not a real nice way to, to preach, is it? 40 more days. There's not, there's not even any solution. There's no, there's no good news there at all. It's all, you're all bad. Yay, God's going to destroy you. I mean, it's 40 more days. That's it. And the king of Nineveh, because the word's gotten up to him, declares a fast for all of Nineveh. And the people, many of them have already been fasting and praying. Because see, it took so long to get through this. He hasn't gotten all the way through the town. But the word's been spreading. And they're saying, oh no. God's calling us to judgment. Oh no. We need to repent. Oh no. This is a terrible thing. They're broken. And they start praying and asking God, God forgive us. And verse verse. 9 in chapter 3, the king says, Who knows, God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. That's good news, isn't it? God just said to Nineveh, I'm, I'm going to destroy you in 40 days. They repent, and God says, I'm not going to destroy you. And that's good news, except for Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah 4, verses 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. 
And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, listen to this, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Really? I knew that you love people. I knew that you are gracious, that you forgive people their sins, and that you're slow to anger God, and that you're abounding in love, that you're a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that you're that kind of God that if they repent, you'd accept it. Wow. This is a pretty serious indictment against Jonah, isn't it? He knew these things about God, and because of that, he said, I went the other way because I knew that you would forgive these people if they repented, and I didn't want that to happen. And Jonah learns something new about God because he obeyed. Not only is he gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love for those who love him, for those who repent, but there's something else that Jonah will learn because he obeys. Chapter 4, verse 9. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? I probably should tell you the rest of the story. Jonah went outside the city. He's just ticked off at God and is upset, worn out from his preaching. What a long sermon. But going all through the city, he gets out there. He's not happy that God is forgiving them. And so he sits down, and a tree goes, a plant grows up and gives him shade for a day. And then a worm comes along. <laughs> And he eats on the plant, and the plant dies. And for the next day, he's out in the sun. He's like, oh, God, just let me die. This is such a horrible life I'm after. The plant that shaded me is gone. Oh, God, this is terrible. And then what does he say? But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He actually gets ticked off at God, not just because he forgave the Ninevites, but because the plant's going. Oh, God, what would you do this to me? You brought me out here, and now just kill me, God. And how does Jonah respond to God? I, I guess he obviously believed in his kindness, because look at the way he responds. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is! And I'm uh, so angry, I wish I were dead. Oh, that'll really work. <laughs> I'm so ticked off, I just wish I'd die right now because that plant is dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. You didn't give it life. It just grew up right beside you. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. God's saying, Jonah, really? You're ticked off? You're ticked off about this tree? You're really ticked off because I care about Nineveh? But Jonah, there are 120,000 people in this city who don't have the ability of determining their right from their left. They, they are basically not understanding things about life. They're in such a t difficult and tough place that I care about them. So what does he say? God says, I'm concerned about 120,000 souls. Oh, by the way, and the animals around here. God's even concerned about his creation, isn't he saying that right here? Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's the answer for why suffering continues in our world. Why doesn't God end it? Why doesn't he just put a stop to all pain? All difficulty, all suffering. Let's call it what it is. Why doesn't he end all evil? I mean, aren't we all affected by the, the, the fruit of evil in our world? Why doesn't he just end all the, every aspect of bad stuff there is? Because when he does, it's the, it's the dividing line in God time. 
It's the dividing line that says those on this side of the line who have accepted my love will live with me forever and those on this side of the line who have not accepted my love and rejected me will never have to live with me. And what does he say? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand. The reason why he hasn't rushed to destroy evil is he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's why Jesus waits to return. And that's what God is trying to teach Jonah. Every one, every one matters to him. See, when you, when you obey God, this is what Jonah's experience, when you obey God, you get to know God in a new way. It happened for Moses. It happened for the children of Israel. What did God say to Moses? He said, Moses, okay, you go down, you set my people free. And, and he says, let me prove to you that this is going to happen. When you come back here with all the people, you'll worship on this mountain. That will be evidence that I sent you. <laughs> Do you catch the irony there? You go, you set them free. By the way, Pharaoh's not going to like you. He's going to reject you. He's going to argue with you. He's going to say no, because I'm going to make him say no, incidentally. I'm going to harden his heart. But you're going to plunder them, and proof that all this is going to happen is you're going to come back and worship me on this mountain. Um, God, I think you have the order messed up a little bit. Why don't we do the worship out here on the mountain? Then I'll know I'm supposed to go set them free. Moses, go. Obey. And if you obey, Moses, then you will experience more of me. If you obey, then you'll get to know me in ways like you haven't known me before. 1 John 2, 3 to 6 says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If you know God, you're going to do what he says. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. If I say, I know God, but I'm not doing what God says, what am I calling myself? I'm a liar. And I'm saying, I know him, I know what really matters to him, but I'm just not going to do it. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. My love for God grows as I obey God. Isn't that true in your relationships? When you do something that someone you love wants you to do, doesn't that grow your relationship? But isn't there the other side of it true also? When you say you love somebody, but you won't do what they want or need, what are you really saying to them? I don't really care about you. You don't really matter to me. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If we, if we want to really know God, need to do the same things that Jesus did. I mentioned already, affirmation comes after we obey. You know what the reward for obedience is? Obedience is the outward expression of our love for God. It says, God, I care about you, I love you, so I'm gonna do what you say. And here's the thing, we need to start with obeying what we already know is God's will. Can you think of some things that you know are God's will? Let me give you a hint. Jesus summarized the law with two statements. The first one he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you know that? Are you doing it? Start with doing what you already know is God's will. What is the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing that? Because if you're not loving your neighbor, you're already saying, God, even though I say I love you, even though I say I'm going to obey you, if you're not loving your neighbor, you're already saying what? First, Second Peter says you're already a liar. Ouch. Begin with doing what you already know God wants you to do. If you're questioning, you know, God, what's your will for my life? What should I do, be doing even this week? What should I do with the rest of my life? Start by doing what you know already God wants you to do. What did he tell us to do when he left the disciples on the mountain? He said, go and make disciples. 
do what you already know is God's will. Are we supposed to share the love of Jesus with children here in this community? How, how's one way to do that? Invite children to VBS. Do what you know is God's will to do. When you say, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. What are you supposed to do? Give. Time, talents, treasures, everything. How about all the one another's? Do what you already know is God's will. What are we supposed to do? How about serve one another? Love one another. Forgive one another. Be kind to one another. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Cry with one another. Rejoice with one another. Do what you already know is God's will. Oh, and here's one. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles you. Throw it off. Do what you already know is God's will. And here's the promise. When you obey God, you will come to know him in new and more intimate ways. Henry Blackaby said, a church will not know and experience the fulfilling of God's purposes if its members are unwilling to pay the price of obedience. Are we obeying the Lord? It's as we obey that we get to know him better. It's as we obey that we experience the power of God. It's as we do what we already know we should be doing that we will then experience what God wants us to experience with him. Let's pray. God, uh, most of us will say, oh, I'd never do what Jonah did. Really? How many times a week, God, do you invite us to do something and we turn the other way? How many times this last week, Lord, have you asked us to do something? It may have been just speak a kind word to your spouse. And we were ticked, so we weren't going to. Or you asked us to show some kindness to that neighbor. And we thought, they're rude. Why would I want to waste my time? And we even saw a child and said, oh, there'd be somebody I could invite, and we didn't. God, there are so many opportunities that you give to us to obey you. And we confess, God, that we fail often. Lord God, I want to thank you for some of the ways that we have obeyed you. And the difference that's, that, that has made already for us, the excitement that's growing in this church, even as we try to obey what you're saying about that corner down there, as we... As, as we try to do what you're saying about creating a whole new environment with our youth ministry, as we try to obey what you're saying about caring about children and families, Lord, as, as we're trying to learn to love each other, God, we are learning to obey and we are getting to know you better. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, God, today for the person whom you're saying, Please come, follow me. The person that you're inviting this day to accept your love that you demonstrated on the cross when you died and then rose from the dead. I pray for the person who's needing to accept your power to defeat the enemy, and it may be an addiction, it may be their own anger may be their own temptation, God, I pray that, that you would help them to obey. God, we don't just want to talk about you. We don't just want to be religious. We want to have a better relationship. We want to know you more. We want to follow you. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.